Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. This is the second half, the post-break half of lecture two, first week. Um, so as promised, we're going to compare the power of DFAs and NFAs. But first, let's talk about some notation needed to make that comparison. Uh, so uh, for any machine, let's say D, we define uh, normal script L of D to be the language, like the set of strings, uh, accepted or decided by machine uh, D. This is general. This is a general definition. This is beyond DFAs, NFAs for everything. This is for um, any any kind of machine. So, like if uh, L of D is equal to L of D prime, let's say we have two different machines. However, they accept the same set of words, then we would say the machines are equivalent. So, code you may understand there may be two different pieces of code which can do the exact same thing. Like they behave the same on all inputs. Forget time and all that. Just forget. Just care about if they say yes or no on the same uh, inputs. Uh, two pieces of code can be semantically equivalent, but may syntactically be different. So D and D, um, D, uh, D prime may may look different, uh, but behave. the same, right? For code, this one's kind of obvious. You can just int put new lines in or tab it or whatever, right? So different code, same behavior. Um, for not a specific machine, but a, a kind of machine, for a kind of machine, uh, let's just say like like DFAs. Uh, we denote the curly L of DFA equal the class of languages uh, decidable by. Uh, DFAs. So the D LDFA is exactly the regular languages. Uh, so by definition, it, LDFA is exactly the regular language. The uh, regular languages. Uh, recall uh, that a language is regular if and only if there exists a DFA to decide it. So normal script L is the language itself of that specific machine. Fancy script L is the entire class. So the elements of this are words that are accepted. And this is, the elements of this are languages. So all the regular languages and exactly the regular languages are in LDFA. LDFA is the class of languages. It's a set of languages. To each language corresponds one many uh, DFAs. Right? We need this notation in order to compare and contrast different automata power from each other. Um, since uh, every uh, NFA, excuse me, since every uh, DFA is an NFA, um, then the class of languages decidable by DFAs are also happen to be decidable. Uh, by interface, 
right? So using this notation, we can say uh, that the NFAs are equal to or more powerful than uh, the DFAs. So here we have that since every DFA is an NFA, there is a take any DFA, it's going to decide some language. That language is going to be an LDFA. Then, because that DFA is also an NFA, there exists an NFA to decide that same language, which is then putting that same language in LNFA. So we get a containment one way at least. Yes? What is the meaning of the for each in that line there? In the last line? Like, recall that a language is regular if and only if for each. Oh, if only if there exists a oh, DFA. Oh, that's, oh, sorry. There exists a DFA. Yeah. Okay. I should be more thorough. If. Uh, there exists a DFA to decide it, yeah. Right, so like, uh, just a high-level high proof of this, if L is in, and the statement should be obvious, but I want to work through it just so we understand uh, maybe some of the mechanics that are involved in proofs like this. So if L is an L DFA, uh, then there, then, there exists a DFA uh, D to uh, decide L. What that really means is that the language decided by D is equal to L. Right? So if L is an L DFA, it's regular. There exists a DFA for it. Um, uh, since every a DFA is also an NFA. D is also an NFA. So there exists an NFA, a name D, to decide L. So L is decidable by an NFA. So uh, L is in uh, L NFA. Since this is for all L in L DFA. We see that LDFA is a subset of LNFA. This proof is really, really verbose. There's a lot of writing. I don't think it's all necessary. I think maybe it should be obvious that if something was decidable by a DFA, every DFA being an NFA, it's also decidable by an NFA. I just wanted to be verbose with the proof here, so you might, one might. Uh, what one might look like. So we now know the, the NFAs are more powerful than the DFAs, but are, are they strictly more powerful? Like, could it be uh, be that uh, L uh, DFA is a strict subset? Of LNFA? Uh, could uh, there exist a language which is decidable by an NFA, but then not decidable uh, by a DFA?
Uh, the answer is, well, let's hear some guesses. If you guys think this is true. Is the, is the NFA computational model strictly more powerful than the DFA one? We showed that NF, it is more, uh, it's greater than or equal to, but could it be equal to or strictly greater than? Greater than. Why? I don't know. I just know. It does seem magical. So that's the gut feeling should be that it does seem uh, stronger. However, it's not the case. It's actually the case that uh, the DFA, the languages decidable by DFAs are equivalent to the languages <coughs> decidable by NFAs. So two quick remarks on this. One, every DFA is an NFA, but not every NFA is a DFA. But there may exist a different DFA. We don't care about the program itself. We care about the behavior of the program. So there may, they may exist another DFA that's equivalent to the NFA. That's what we're going to end up doing. We already pr proved the containment one way. In order to prove this, we only need to prove the containment one, uh, the other way. Uh, L... Uh, NFA, every language is decidable by an NFA. Uh, we're going to uh, show it's decidable by a DFA. Right? Here, we conclude that the NFAs are no more powerful than the DFAs, and that the NFAs decide exactly the regular languages. So we're going to convert and NFA into a DFA, basically. Yes? So you can, you can change any NFA into a DFA? Yes. Ah, so, here, so again, program, we don't care about the program, we care about behavior. What we're going to do is we're going to take an NFA. It's going to decide some language in LNFA. We're going to show that there exists an equivalent DFA to that NFA. We're going to convert, the, by converting the NFA to a DFA and maintaining the correctness of it, it's going to now, we have now shown a DFA for this language decidable by some NFA. And this process we're going to give, because it works for any NFA, we're going to be able to convert all the NFAs to DFAs. And therefore, they have to be the same. Right? We were able to show every DFA was an NFA, but we're also going to show that every, for every, we're not going to be able to show that every NFA is a DFA, because the NFAs look different. They have epsilon transitions and other things. But we're going to show a way to convert this. We're going to go around all these new rules we made using deterministic tricks, basically. We're going to show how to do the epsilon transition, the uh, implicit reject, and the non-deterministic transition. We're going to show how you can do all that, basically, with deterministic, be deterministic things. Now, as a, as a final comment before we get onto the proof, I guess like two more final comments. One, this doesn't say anything about efficiency. So the NFAs are far more efficient than the DFAs, right? The NFAs are small and tiny, and you can do nice things with them because they're so small, but the DFAs maybe are big and ugly. We don't care about efficiency at all. We care about power. So we're concerned with the possible languages which are decidable by these machines at all. Like, what are they even capable of? So it's what's going to... The reason I'm mentioning this is because we're going to give... Given some NFA, we're going to construct a DFA. The DFA is going to be exponentially larger in space. The size of the NFA is going to be much, much bigger. The, excuse me, the DFA is going to be much, much bigger. The DFA is going to be much, much uglier. But that's okay. We don't care about how efficient it is. We just care that the DFA exists at all. We're concerned with the existence of computers for these problems and not the problems themselves. Yes? Is it more efficient because of the assumption that multiple like, processes can be computed instantaneously? Like, if you... If you go by the VFS and then you say the VFS takes like, oh man, then it wouldn't be more efficient, right? Or? The, this, this question I think will be answered during the proof as you see why we convert to thing. It's really, the heart of it is that you're in multiple positions at once. 
you can do multiple things. So kind of through the PFS. Your question? Um, when you wrote could there exist a language in curly L NFA backslash, what, is, what are you trying that to do? That is set minus. So in NFA, but not in LDFA. So you said that that's not true. Yes. So the answer, the, I, I put two questions on here. The answer to both of these. Right. So uh, a narrative of this, of this class is we're trying to build a computer, and we're trying to actually build a reasonable model of computation, like one that captures our intuitive notion of computation. We started with the DFA. We noted it might be weak. We haven't proven it's weak, but we've noted it might be weak. And then we generalized it to NFAs, and we thought, well, maybe we built a better computer. But actually, we haven't. It turns out the computer we built was the same. So we haven't built a better computer. We built the same computer. Um, so uh, one more quick comment is actually this uh, comes from a paper by Rabin and Scott in 1957. And they won a Turing Award for this proof. And the, the award was like 1976 or something like this. Just to show you how low the bar was back then, you could get a Turing Award for now something that's presentable in half of a summer class. So computer science has come a long way. Um, so actually, I think the, the, the Turing Award that a few months ago was given to the guy, Bob Met, Metcalf. He invented Ethernet, right? So really, they give it to a lot of diverse and different uh, uh, fields. But it's worth mentioning that the proof we're going to do earned these guys uh, a Turing Award, because I think that's cool. Um, right. So in a, in a DFA, what is a, what is a DFA, essentially? Like, if you're at a position in a DFA, that corresponds to like an English sentence of being in some state, right? So like uh, you, a, a, D, a state of a DFA is only reachable if certain conditions are met, right? So like so if you're here, it's like I saw an A. So each state kind of has like an understandable way of what that state means, right? If I'm at this state here, all that means was that I saw an A and then I saw a B. So if I'm here, I can do whatever I want under the assumptions that I only reach this state using an A and using a B. In that sense, every state also corresponds to like a line of a program in a very, very, very limited sense, right? Like if you had a program code, like it was like if, I don't know, word, 0 equals a equals a if word 1 equals 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 b. This line of code, whatever it is, that is only reachable if the first two previous conditions were satisfied, right? So a line of code is only reachable. If you reach a line of code, there are some assumptions you can make about what got you there in the first place. Uh, similar things with the states. The states kind of correspond in a very limited way to like lines of code in that sense, right? Very, very weakly. Um, so if we were, if we want to convert an NFA to a uh, DFA, right? In an English understanding, what should the states of our, DSP, uh, of our DFA correspond to? So just to just to make sure we know what the question is, we want to build a DFA to simulate an NFA, we'll say N, what should each state of the DFA correspond to of the NFA? Yes? Should it respond to like the power set of the states? Power set. So what does each state correspond to? A certain set of set. Right. So what, what would that necessarily correspond to? What is So being in this state... Oh, is it like a certain like path to an acceptance state or yeah. a path to like a rejection state? Right. So exactly. So in a, the, the thing with an NFA is you can be in multiple states at once, right? Something like this. You can be in multiple states at once non-deterministically in a way you can't do deterministically. So... However, being in a set of states at the same time, you're in a superposition of states. What that really means, that's still finitely many, though. You can, 
sure you can be in two states at once, but two is still a finite number of states at once. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a DFA such that each state of the DFA corresponds to being in a subset of this set, a set of states of the NFA, and being in the state in an English sentence corresponds to I am in these states simultaneously in the NFA. So like if I was in the superposition of those states at the same time. For example, let's say, let's call this Q0, Q1, and Q2, right? Something like this. This is like a subset of a bigger uh, NFA. Let's say there's something here, right? So what I might have in the NFA is if I come here and I'm in Q1 and Q2 simultaneously, what I'm going to have is I'm going to have a state here that goes like, Something like that. So I go from Q0, something like this, to the state 1, 2. And 1, 2 here, not 12, it's 1, 2. 1, 2 represents as if I was in the NFA. The DFA simulates the NFA. It's as if I was in both of those states at once. Yes? Is this similar to like combining two DFAs together, where it's, it's like the different branches, and then you just combine Ah, them. when we combine the two DFAs together, we took the intersection of them, or the union, and... Uh, that was simulating two DFAs on one DFA. So we did a simulation there. Here we're doing a simulation as well. We needed finitely many states. So we did the Cartesian product. You can think of it like a product of DFAs, or you can think of it like we built one DFA to simulate as if it was running two DFAs at once. We needed the product of the number of states in order to simulate as if we were in both positions at once. We need one state for any possible position we could be in DFA1 or DFA2. So in that sense, we needed like quadratically more states to simulate both DFAs at the same time. Here, we need exponentially more states to simulate where one state corresponds to being in a superposition of the possible states. So if the NFA has n states, you're going to need 2 to the n, worst case, 2 to the n uh, states in your DFA. So we're going to convert an NFA to a DFA. The DFA is going to have exponential blow up in the number of states. You need, like, the power set of the entire... Exactly. NFA. You need one state to correspond okay. to every possible subset of states you could be in the NFA at once. You can be in any position at once, and there are two to the n possible positions. So that's, that's part of the, the efficiency of the NFA blow-up. It comes from that exponentialness. All right, let me just uh, define some notation. Um, yeah, go over here. So first off, we need to really handle some of the epsilon-ness. So we define this function called reach. Reach of a state like qi is equal... Uh, where QI is in QI is in some uh, NFA, we say reach of QI is anything reachable from QI through epsilon state uh, epsilon transitions. So, like uh, the reach of QI is going to be QI and any state uh, reachable from QI by Epsilon transitions. So if we had something like this, uh, the reach of Q1, Q, QI, Q1 is going to be it's going to be Q1, but then it's also going to be anything reachable from Q1 by epsilon transitions. So it's going to include Q2, but it's also going to inc include Q3 because you can go from to Q3 from Q1 by epsilon epsilon, right? Like those flat escalators, you can just take two sequentially and then you're there without having to do any walking. So if, you were, if this was some subset of an NFA and you were at Q1, you could just teleport to Q3 and resume your computation from there. Right? 
So in some sense, this is like the reach is like the deterministic-ish what we need for uh, to de non determinisify the NFA, basically. Um, right, so let me give you um, the process. So uh, for NFA n, and we'll, we'll name the parts of it q sigma q0 uh, delta and f, we build. Uh, DFA we're going to call this Q prime sigma prime Q zero prime delta prime and F prime so uh, what is going to be Q here so Q prime is going to be what we want as we mentioned earlier we want one state per set of states. So if the NFA had n states, had, had states q, what should q prime be in the DFA? Our set of q. Yes. We want one state corresponding to the possible subsets. Uh, sigma prime, thankfully, is going to stay the same. Don't want to mess with anything. Uh, there. Uh, q zero prime this one's a little tricky what is q zero prime if, if there's only one star state you can just use the same one but if there's multiple you make a new one so let's just suppose because the nfa is given with one start state what would be the start state of the dfa again we can only have one ah got you Exactly. Anything you can, you can re recall for reach, you can either start at the start or anything you could jump to and start from there. So it's actually not going to be Q0. It's going to be the reach of Q0. Um, now, here's the hard part. How do you define delta? So the way we're going to define it is, like, if you're at a set of states, if you're at a state in the DFA, that is you representing a superposition of states in the NFA. So you want the transitions going out from your DFA state to represent the simulation of the NFA as if you were going out from those states. So what that means is let's say we were at some single state like Q1 to QK. And it's not necessarily that the states in the transition are going to be nicely numbered that way. But let's just suppose there is a set of states that way. So you're, you go from some state, which is represented by a set of states in the NFA, so we're at some state represented by Q1 to QK, and you see a symbol A, right? Uh, what you want to do is go to the state represented by this superposition of the possible states you could have been in the NFA. So what this is going to be is going to be the union of, of the set of states you could be in that way, right? So we're going to call this the union of like k equals 1 to, oh, can't use k, i equals 1 to k of, and it's not going to be just the transition of the states themselves, but it's going to be the reach of those states. So it's actually going to be the reach of uh, delta of q i comma a. That may seem like an arduous and long and not clear uh, transition function, but it will make more sense when we do the example, because it, it's, it's quite clear when we do the example. Yes? How can a DFA have multiple start states? DFA can't. Ah, uh, but there is, reach is going to return a set. And that set is going to be one state. Oh, you're right. Because the right. states are the thing. Yeah. Right. Again, with the example, there's a lot of moving parts because there's hash, there's like, apostrophe versions of our DFA, but then the NFA doesn't have it, and then there's this elements, the states themselves are just sets of states. That the, there's a lot of moving on. It'll make perfect sense when we do the example, I think. Yeah? So when we make an NFA, do we want it to be, like, as reduced as possible? That way the power ah, set will be as small as possible. A question of the first kind. Uh, as long as there exists an NFA, that's good enough. We care about the existence of these programs at all. Not 
not okay. how efficient they are. I mean, it would be great for gradeability if you turned in something clean, um, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Really, the fact that it exists at all is, 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 is phenomenal. All right, and we have one last thing. Uh, what do we want our final states to look like? Just a set of all sets that are of all states that are accepting. The set of sets of all sets. Wait, the set no, of no, no, no. The set of states that are accepting. So, like, it'll be like a set of states that are accepting, and then there'll be like a corresponding state to all the sets. I yes. Mean, to all those so, states, right? the reason I ask this is because it's actually really hard to write this out in English, but everyone, I think, understands what's going on. So, the mathematical no notation I have for this one is like we have a little f for every subset of the states of the NFA. As long as one of those, one of those, uh, as long as that set contains um, a final set of the original NFA, then we're good. Oh, okay. So as long as like at least one state and F prime is accepting. In the NFA, it's fine? Yes. So like if Q2 is a final state, every set containing Q2 is final. Why? Like if you're at some set containing Q2, you are in the superposition of possible states you could be including Q2, and that means you're at an accept state. So we define the computation, the non-deterministic computation to accept if you hit one accept state. So you accept. So that's why it's basically as long as it contains one accept state. Uh, again, kind of difficult to define in English, but pretty clear in human words. And it's going to make much more sense when we do this example. Let's do uh, the same example we had. L something was like uh, W is a word, and W ends with A A. Okay. So as a as an NFA, what was this? This was like. Um, Like uh, something like this, right? I'll make sure everything is labeled. So this was our NFA for L, right? Um, now we're going to follow the algorithm that we defined and give a DFA for it. Right, so I have the premonition to know how messy this is going to get. So I'm actually going to put my circles in a very specific spot. We want one state per set of states of the NFA. So I'm going to put them in this order.
So 0, 1, 2 is not really 0, 1, 2, but it's the set corresponding to like q0, q1, q2, right? I've just shortened the notation so I don't have to write a set in each element. I just can keep the index of the numbers. There's three q's, now I have one q, right? First thing to note is there's already a lot of states on the board. Um, that's like eight states. It's, that's eight. Uh, that's a lot of states. Hopefully, we won't have to use them all. Um, so, what is the start state? Well, the start state is going to be the start state of the NFA plus anything reachable from the start state. I'm thankful to have chosen an example that doesn't use any epsilon transitions. So, it might be slightly less informative, but it's certainly going to be easier. So, the start state is going to be none other than the start state here and anything reachable from it. So, it's just going to be it. Start state. Okay. Um, what are the final states? Yes, exactly. Yes. So Q2 is going to be a final state. But so will Q12. And recall the state Q1, Q2, this, this state 1, 2 basically corresponds to as if you were in the NFA in both Q1 and Q2 only. Just both those states at the same time. Same thing with 0, 2 and 0, 1, 2. By the way, uh, we have this, you know, the empty set is also a set. Uh, it's really here as our purgatory, because we have an implicit reject thing, right? That's what the empty set is going to end up being, the empty set state. And also, uh, if each state is being in uh, that set of states at the same time, what does the empty set state correspond to? Yeah, I don't really know what that means, though, but you're right. If you're in, if under our English word understanding of this, this state corresponds to being in the set of those states in the NFA at the same time, being in the empty set means I, I'm in th that set of, set of states of the NFA at the same time, which means I'm in none of the states at the same time. That almost doesn't make sense, but it turns out to work, it's going to work out quite nicely because our transition function is also defined for a union. Union with the empty set does nothing, so it, it's perfect, actually. This is going to end up being our. Uh, Implicit reject state. All the garbage is going to go to here. By the way, if you're in, let's just do this one now. If you're at none of the states at the same time, where can you go if you see an A? Where can you go if you see a B? Back to yourself. Back to yourself. Nowhere, exactly. So we'll just get that one out the way. That's our little you know, purgatory. Uh, OK, so let's say you're in Q0 and you see an A. Where can you go? You can either go in to Q0, stay in Q0, or you can go to Q1. So we take the union of those, and what we say is that we go to 0, 1. If you're in Q0 and you see a B, uh, you can only go to Q0. Right? So we, we're going to go state by state. And now there's exponentially more states. So thank God I also chose a DFA, excuse me, an NFA of three states. If I had an NFA of four states, I would have to do 16 states. So that's like already too much. Um, we're going to go state by state and draw the outgoing two transitions per state, right? If I'm at state zero and one simultaneously and I see an A, I could either go to A, I could go to, I could go to zero, I could go to one, or if I'm at one, I could go to two. So that means I can go to zero, one, or two if I'm at 0, 1, and I see an A. If I'm at 0, 1, and I see a B, where can I go? This is going to reject. This is going to go to Q0. So Q0 union the empty set is going to give me Q0. If I'm at Q, if I'm at, so zero, 0 is defined, 0, 1 is defined. If I'm at all three states simultaneously and I see an A, where can I go? I can go to, if I'm at Q0, Q1, or Q2 at the same time, if I see an A, I can go to Q0, Q1, or Q2. Okay. If I'm at Q0, Q1, and, and Q2, and I see a B, these are going to reject if I see a B. But here I'm going to stay in Q0. So this is going to be 0. I see a b, and I'll draw it above. OK, 
Now we do the other ones. If I'm at one Q1 by itself and I see an A, I'm going to go to Q2 on only Q2. If I'm at Q1 and I see a B, this was an implicit reject. So we get to use our purgatory. If I'm at Q2 and I see an A or a B, I implicitly reject. So here I can just do, right? Now we have uh, one, two, we have two more states to do. If we're at state one, two, the so one in, if we're at, we're considering state one, two, we're at one and two simultaneously, we can go to Q2 or nothing. So it's going to be Q2. If we see an A. If we see a B, we have no, pl we have no choice to, Im but, uh, to implicitly reject from both of these. OK. Now what if we're at 0, 2 simultaneously? We're in a superposition of 0 and 2 at the same time. If we see an A and we're at 0, 2, this is going to reject, but this is going to put us in 0, 1. We see an A. Um, if we're at 0, 2 and we see a B, this is going to reject, but this is going to keep us in B. So when you go to 0? Yes. OK, so we did, we did these states. We did the alphabet is the same. We did the start state. We did the transition function. And we did the final states. So this is now our DFA, which simulates this NFA. But this DFA has some problems, kind of. They're not really problems. This is still a correct DFA. But if in terms of a graph, what would you say this DFA has a property of? They're like unconnected components. And yes. Like impossible to reach. Unconnected. I was going to say disconnected. But unconnected is also, also totally correct, I guess. Uh, yeah, this whole part is unreachable, right? This whole, these four states are unreachable. In fact, not only are these states unreachable, Q02 is unreachable. It's, there's no entry, it's not a start state, so you can't enter into 02. What this means in human words, like back to our English understanding of the simulation, since one is unreachable, one has no incoming arrows, it's impossible in our NFA to be in state one simultaneously just to be in state one by itself. If you're ever in state one in the NFA, you're also in some other state. You're, also in, you're either in anything that's reachable from the start state. We can disregard this whole part. We can cut this off. We can also cut off Q, uh, 0, 2 here. If I were to cut those off and rewrite the DFA, I'm going to rewrite it here. So this is the NFA. I'm going to rewrite the DFA here. Okay, yeah, that's it. Oh, all right. So uh, notice that this DFA, when we trimmed the fat, is exactly the DFA that we gave before. That's exactly the DFA that we gave originally when we gave one NFA and one DFA to compare. They ended up being the same. Um, in general, it's not, so this process does not give you anything like a minimal DFA or anything close to anything nice, but it, that doesn't matter. What we care about is that this process gives you a DFA at all. So we have a DFA. Awesome. We were able to convert any NFA to a DFA. Uh, we were also able to clean it up at the end and get something else out of it, which is you know, uh, good for us, I guess. If we actually cared about simplifying a DFA, this is, if we actually cared what the DFA uh, was, this is what we get. Here's a big picture idea from the course, though. We don't care. We don't care about actually running this algorithm to determine DFAs from specific NFAs. We care that there exists an algorithm at all uh, to convert um, 
and a face to DFAs. So we don't care about the algorithm itself. We don't care about converting things, NFA to DFA. We care that the algorithm exists. We care that there, is a, there does exist a process to convert any NFA into a DFA, and that an NFA, although a non-deterministic and compact object, can be deterministically simulated still with finitely many states. We're still uh, good to go in that part. So if like L is in uh, L NFA, uh, there exists. NFA N to NFA N will say uh, such that the language decided by the NFA is the language. The NFA decides that language because it's an LNFA. Since we can give an equivalent DFA for any NFA, we convert uh, NFA N to DFA, say D. So now uh, there exists a DFA named D to Decide language L. So L is in L uh, DFA. L being decidable by an NFA, we can convert any NFA to a DFA. L is now decidable by a DFA. Uh, since this is true for any L in um, L NFA, we conclude that uh, L uh, NFA is a subset of L DFA. Since we previously know the reverse inclusion, we see that L uh, DFA, oh my god, <laughs> we see that L uh, DFA is equal to L uh, NFA. So the okay. NFAs are exactly as powerful as the DFAs. Yes? How do you handle the epsilon, like the free transition? Oh, we did that with the reach. So the example didn't have that because it gets complicated and messy. But you, by doing reach, we get rid of the epsilons, right? So we, do the, we don't just go to the state, uh, the, the union of the states. We go to the union of the states, and those are also reachable by the epsilon transition. Okay, so when, so like, I'm a, I'm assuming like reach of, is that delta? Reach of uh, delta not primed, QIA. Yeah, so that would be like the reach of the state if there's an A, right? Or is it just the reach? Yeah, of the so state? like whatever we would try. So QIA is going to be uh, something from the NFA, right? 
we're going to have a, uh, we're going to anything reachable from that state in the NFA. Okay, so even if there's like an epsilon OV covered in the Exactly. Okay. We count that as part of the union. Okay. Right? Because like, you do this, you can go to here, or you can go to the end. And that reach covers both. So you, you, that would be covered in your union, necessarily. Thank you. Good question. Yes. Does the empty set state having like self transitions for all transitions? Is that always the case in this algorithm? Yeah. Because right. we have an implicit reject. Right. Yeah, so we need to just add it explicitly, right? right. And having more than one reject state doesn't really matter. Like having right. two different shortcuts to the garbage bin, you can just have one shortcut to the garbage bin, right? So it's, it's enough that we have one. It's convenient, certainly. OK, any more questions on this proof? We've now proven that the NFAs are uh, exact in power than the DFAs. We, we failed to generalize our DFAs. Yes? This isn't like a question about the topic, but um, is it fine like if we prove something in class and then we just repeat it in a proof? Like We don't need to reprove anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. So. certainly. So again, I want to stress this because the point, and other people who teach this class might do it differently. I don't care that you know how to convert a DFA to an NFA, excuse me, an NFA to a DFA. That's not the importance of the algorithm. The importance of the algorithm is that it takes only a finite, that exponential, if you have a number and you take two to that number, you still only have finitely many, that's still finite, right? So you can simulate uh, an NFA deterministically only using finitely many more states. That's the important part. It needs exponentially more, but finite, that's still finite. So you still need uh, finitely many states in order to do this. Yes? So what's like the importance of DFAs? So like, we just proved that the language, I mean, regular languages are like modeled by both DFAs and NFAs. Yes. Is that like the end? So there... regular languages in two ways. First off, they're a toy computational model. They're very weak, and they're very easy to study in that sense. They're very easy to describe and give. The other idea is that now, if you need to talk about the regular languages, it's sufficient for you to talk about the NFA safely. You don't, because we proved that every NFA is also a DFA. You don't have to give the DFA. You don't have to do this define. Like I mentioned earlier, I like writing programs with undefined behavior because I'm lazy. I don't want to do all this try-catch nonsense, OK? Um, same way here, now you can freely, like you're maybe you're trying to give a DFA for something. Maybe you now can just start using epsilon transitions and non-deterministic behavior and you know, you now have tools in your repertoire in order to write these kinds of programs if you want it, yes. But there are like other types of machines that can compute yeah, more things. Yeah, certainly, right? certainly, absolutely, okay. absolutely. And uh, we will we'll explore that next time. So next time we're going to talk about closure properties. I think you mentioned last time about like the complement of the, of, the, of the states of the DFA. By the way, the complement of the states of the NFA is not the complement of the language of the NFA because there's an implicit reject state. So we'll talk about that next time. We'll also talk about how to prove using some combinatorial arguments that language, there exist languages which are not regular, right? We kind of loosely said like, okay, finitely many states, you can only keep track of finitely many things. There are some languages you can't decide. We'll formally and rigorous, rigorously prove that uh, next time. But uh, that's all I have for you today. I'm around if you guys have any questions. Your homework is going to go out tomorrow, and uh, it'll be due in a week. So, okay.